You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. It's season 14 of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. Performing through the summer months, the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is presented by the Sonic Society for the Mutual Audio Network and features producers and actor troops from the modern age of audio drama who recreate and reproduce classic old-time radio plays. The Playhouse endeavors to bring shows to a contemporary audience for the love of the medium and not in any intended form of copyright infringement of these classic radio plays. And now we go to our host of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. On stage now, me, Mr. David Alt. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome. If you could please take your seats. Hi there, I'm Jack Ward. <laughs> Thank you. And it's my esteemed pleasure to officially open Sonic Summerstock Playhouse Season 14 for your approval. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I know you were expecting David Alt, and this is entirely my fault, as I begged our usual host to allow me to open up the Playhouse this season with tonight's very special feature. David's up there, and the balcony, as usual. Hi, David. Yes, thank you. Thank you, my friend. You know, it's always a joy to be here in the historic Halifax Playhouse. We've had the opportunity to open it a little earlier this year with a mutual stage presentation of Charade from Pete Lutz of Narada Radio. <laughs> Wasn't it a delight? Thank you. And we're hoping to provide more extra seasonal features in the upcoming years. But we're here for summer stock tonight, aren't we? And as I suggested before, we have a phenomenal first performance for you from Jeffrey Billard's Audio Groove Cat Productions and the Amigos Collective, another tale of science fiction wonder from the classic series X-1. So please, sit back from your finest vantage point in the house and join me in welcoming Hallucination Orbit. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown, come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X... Minus... One... Tonight, Hallucination Orbit, by J.T. McIntosh. Mr. Chaka. Sir? Stand by to release pickup rocket. Yes, sir. We'll break orbit in eight hours. Have damage control pull the rods on the number three pile, and then check the leakage. Yes, sir. Try and have the locks cleared of all unessential personnel when that pickup rocket comes back. There's no point in making trouble. I understand, sir. Pickup rocket away, sir. Very well. Take over, Mr. Chaka. I'll be in my quarters if I'm wanted. Well, now then, Mr. Danbury, make yourself comfortable. Why, thank you, Captain. Do you care for a drink? Scotch in that bowl, bourbon in the other. Oh, thank you. Can't quite get used to squirting liquor from a rubber bulb, as if I were oiling a bearing. Well, you'd have a devil of a time pouring from a bottle in freefall. Well, how are you enjoying your trip? It's very interesting. It was very nice of you to give me a lift. You know, 
It would have been eight months before another ship came along. Oh, a lot more than that. With the main Pluto beam station out, probably eight years. Really? That long? I thought the whole run to Pluto was under 18 months. Yes, it, it, it is, when the beam is running. You see, Mr. Danbury, we left Earth 27 days after the beam, broadcast from Pluto station, broke. We've been spaceborne close to six years. I suppose that's why you're in orbit around this planet. Picking up supplies or something, eh? Oh, no, no. This is a standard pickup for the space beam service. We sent a rocket down to take off a man who's been the only inhabitant of this planet for a little over two years. Well, I expect he'll be glad to see you. Well, there's no telling. <laughs> I didn't know I would. After two years of duty, Mr. Danbury, you might not know anything. Oh? Psychiatric troubles? Solitosis. It's from the Latin. Solus. Alone. Is that much of a problem? Only in space. Here, look. Look through that port. Seems empty. It is. It's empty of horizon, sky, sunlight, ground. It's empty of time. It's empty of people. You can't live in it too long without something happening. I see. But surely people have been alone before spaceflight. Ah, oh, yes, but they've been on the same world with other people, and that seems to make a difference. You take a hermit on Earth. He may spend his life trying to escape civilization, but put him on a deserted world? He turns psychotic. Is there a cure? Oh, sure. Put him back with people. At least about 40 people. That seems to be the critical number. See, I have 48 in this ship's complement. I could run her with about 18, but if I tried to, I'd have psychos on my hands six months after blastoff. But then, every one of these men on the beam stations, they're all alone, aren't they? That's right. Well, then, they must get it. Oh, they do. It wouldn't pay to leave more than 40 men on a space station, and less than 40 is too dangerous. Solitosis can be homicidal, so they leave one man, and he gets it all right. But you can snap him out of it just by taking him back to Earth. That's why I like to have as few people as possible around when the pickup ship comes back. It can be pretty unpleasant. What are they like? How does it affect them? Well, so far I've picked up about 28 space station officers. I've seen 28 different sets of symptoms. I wouldn't want the job of getting those guys out of their stations and into that pickup rocket. Captain here. Pickup rocket signaling, sir. All right, Mr. Chaka. Prepare to receive the pickup. Alert the psychiatric staff and I'll be right there. Would you care to see them bring him in, Mr. Danbury? You're welcome if you have a strong stomach. <laughs> I don't think so. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chaka, as soon as the rocket is secured, make a trajectory for the next station. Yes, sir. That's Pluto Station 3. Carry on. Huh. Pluto Station 3. That'll be a honey of a job. He's been on that lump of rock all by himself for close to six and a half years. Pluto Station 3, Daily Report. Kyle Nord, Space Officer. Everything is in fine shape. Through my port, I can see Mars, Earth, Saturn, Mercury. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, that little devil. He's hiding behind the sun. He's been quite furtive lately. Why I'm required to record this report every day escapes me. Because it's quite obvious to any empty-headed brass hat at the central office that not a word of this has been worth the tape it's been recorded on for the last five and a half years. But if it amuses you gentlemen to hear me wander, after all, you are paying for the tape. Ah! Which gives me a fine thought. I'm going to set the pickups through the whole station and leave the tape running. That'll give you a daily report all day. So keep on listening. Right now, I have the distinct impression that Earth is winking at me. A rather suggestive lewd wink. It helps to see the planets, doesn't it? Hmm? Oh, I... Uh... I thought you were reading. I was. 
You know, if you hadn't been able to see the planets, you would have been a straight jacket case long ago. Well, who knows I'm not one now. You don't, anyway. Well, I think that so long as you talk sanely about madness, you can't be so far gone. It's out there somewhere, isn't it? The rescue ship? Somewhere. How long now, Colin? Where could they be now if they started whenever the beam failed? I haven't worked it out since the last time you asked. But they could be very close. If the beam hadn't failed, they would have been here long ago, wouldn't they? Oh, sure. Eleven months with the beam, over six years without it. Well, anyway, that triple time. Six years' pay adds up to quite a pile. <laughs> oh, you'll be set up for life when you get back to Earth, won't you? And at 29... I'll be rotten with money. Oh, well, <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. That's because of the others before you. I've learned a lot. Never talk of the others. And above all, never talk of any others to come. I'm sorry. Would you like to play chess? It's a long time since we did. I don't think so. Not anymore. I'm a little tired of chess. Oh, I, I know. I know. I, I understand. I won't bother you. I'll go to my room, Colin. Well, don't get upset. I'm not. I understand. You're just tired of chess. You still listening, gentlemen? That last few minutes might have been a little confusing. You'd like to know who I was talking to, wouldn't you? I'm afraid you can't hear her on the tape. That's Una, and I'll tell you what she looks like. You might find it interesting. She's beautiful, but rather cool. She always wears a white shirt and sharp creased green slacks. She's got a good figure, but in a calm sort of way. She plays a good game of chess, although I beat her two out of three times. Of course, you know why you can't hear her on the tape. But I still know. That's a point in my favor, isn't it? And that brings up an interesting question, gentlemen, because I'm tired of Una. I'm beginning to find her a long, cool, slightly unappealing bore. My problem is how to get rid of her. I can't just tell her to vanish. She's a little too real for that. I dreamed up a ship to bring her. I'll have to find another to take her away. Well, I might as well get to it. No. No, I'm not going to bother about the ship. It's too much mental effort. I'd have to think up everything I saw. And frankly, gentlemen, I'm... I'm too tired. Maybe she'll take the hint. A lot of them did. Susie did. And Alice. Oh. Remember Margie? Oh, <laughs> there was a girl. A load of bricks had to fall on her head. Took me four weeks to get rid of her. <laughs> uh, no. Let Una figure her own way to get off the station. Well, she's gone. I thought she might. Her ship's gone, too. Well... All in all, I don't think Una was really very satisfactory. 
One of these days, I'll start believing in them, and I'll be really gone. Well, if I activate the main screens now, I'll see a ship coming into land pretty soon. Every once in a while, I have a thought that when the ship really comes, I'll think it's make-believe. Yes, there it is. A small ship curving in for a landing. I suppose I could check on the detectors. I know they register anybody within a hundred thousand miles, but I don't bother checking them anymore because someday the moment will come when I check the detectors and I'll see just what I want to see. Well, the ship's coming in for a landing now. I'll go out and meet it. I'm rather interested to find out what the explanation will be for the girl. Naturally, it will be a girl. It's all right. You can take your helmet off. The air's all right in here. You must be Baker. Oh, <laughs> Good heavens, no. Baker was before me here. You can't be one of his dreams seven years late. I'm Ord. Colin Ord. Before we go any further, how does solitosis affect you? Well, that's new. None of them ever asked that before. It makes me see things that aren't there. And you know there's nothing there? Hmm... Sometimes. Do you know I'm here? I'm making a point of not wondering about it. Well, one thing you can be sure of. This. Do you see this? This is a gun. I just want you to know I'm not Heaven's little girl to lonely space station officers. Is that clear? Oh, yes. Yes. What's your name? Elsa Catterline. You want to know why I'm here, of course. Not particularly. What? Well, that's always the weakest part of the story. I don't like to press it. So why don't you, uh, take off your spacesuit? I'll tell you why just the same. I killed a man. Why and how doesn't matter. I had access to an experimental ship. I thought if I disappeared for about two years, everyone would forget about it. Oh, please. Don't labor over it. I'm not asking questions. Why not? Well, when we get around to it, I would be interested in the story you can concoct for being dressed like the cover of a magazine story in rather minimal clothing. It's been years since I thought up anything like that. You must be a throwback. What are you talking about? You know... You're going to have a tough time with that gun when you get tired of holding it. It's a heavy gun. How long do you think it'll be before I take it from you? After all, you have to sleep. And there's no door in the station you can lock that I can't get in. I know. I just wanted to make sure you weren't violent. I think I can get on with you, Ord. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I see. The question is, my dear, whether you're real or not. Well, don't I look real? Oh, yes. But that doesn't prove anything. As a matter of fact, the realer you look, the worse off I might be. But then, there still is the remote possibility that you might actually have killed someone and decided to hide out in a space station. Shall I tell you something else, Elsa? What? I'm suddenly tired of the whole business. Breathes there a man with soul so dead. I'm sure you know the rest of it. I would suddenly like to have enough people around me so that I could be sane. 
I would like to find women as part of life, instead of having them pop up here from the depths of my rather indelicate subconscious. Ah, but you've shaken me, Elsa. Twenty-four hours ago, I was congratulating myself that solitosis hadn't really gotten me. But now, I don't know. Just don't try anything funny, or you'll find out whether I'm real. The hard way. <sighs> anyway is the hard way. First, I'll go out and have a look at your ship. Fourteen pounds per square inch air. Heat. Now, I take a gasoline lighter. There. The flame lights. But, on the other hand, if there was no lighter and I see it, I could also see it burn when there isn't any air. As a matter of fact, how do I know that I can read a meter for air pressure. And now that I look again quickly, I find I haven't got a lighter in my hand. And, as a matter of fact, the pressure meter reads zero. There's no air in this ship. <laughs> as a matter of fact, there isn't any ship. Elsa is no more real than Una. Mm. <sighs> All right, Colin, old boy. Sit there and concentrate for about 15 minutes, and you'll be able to walk through the walls of this ship. Well, what did you find out there? You'd better leave. It was a mistake you're coming here. I'm sorry. No, don't come any closer to me. Put down the gun. Keep back. I'm warning you. Keep back. You see? It's no use. Oh, you're a good shot. You got me right between the eyes. But I couldn't feel a thing. I can't let myself be shot, now can I? Give that to me. There. Now, remember, if you shoot me, nothing happens. But if I shoot you, you die. Do you know that? Yes, I know that. I'll give you about 20 minutes to get yourself back into that spacesuit and get off my planet! Frankly, I'm getting tired of hallucinations. Tired! Give me back my gun. No, 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 no. I'll keep that. After a while, I'll put it in a drawer, and it'll stay there until I forget it. Then there won't be any gun anymore. From now on, my overblown figment, there will be no more Elsa's. Or Susie's, or Margie's. I am not going to give in to Salatosis. Maybe. Maybe I'll bring Una back. At least she could play chess. Pluto Station 3, Daily Report. Colin Ord, Space Officer. Gentlemen, I have successfully fought off solitosis for two days and I have been alone. However, I'm afraid I'll lose as I watch my main scope now. I see a ship coming in again. I wonder what this one will be like. 
It's a launch from a larger spaceship. Maybe a lifeboat. Ah. Dorothy came in on a lifeboat. I wonder what this one will be like. I've got to find out when she comes whether she's real. That's the key. As long as I know if she's real when I don't care anymore, that's when it's really got me. The ship's down now. There she comes out of the airlock. I've got to find out whether she's real. Colin Ord? That's right. I'm Dr. Lynn of Four Star Lines. Marilyn Lynn? Oh, very pretty. Are you going to tell me your story now, or do I have to wait? I'm not going to tell you anything until I've found out a little more about you. Well, you're an improvement on the last one. At least you're young and beautiful. And you're not fantastic. And you look intelligent. What do you mean? Oh, don't worry about me. I see things that aren't there. Particularly people. Oh. So you don't believe I'm here? Would you, if you were me? Do you know I'm not here? No. That comes with time. At least it always has so far. You mean you've always proved to yourself that your visitors are fantasies? With a struggle. Interesting. Controlled solitosis. Huh. I never heard of it before. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Ord. No, no. That doesn't make you real. They all say that. Why should I want to make you accept me as real? I don't know. But they all do. When will you know? Oh, I can't say. Maybe in five minutes? Maybe not for hours. How do you do it? You don't shoot me to see... If I die, or anything like that, do you? No, nothing like that. If I shoot you, you do die. Like the witches in history. They'd die if they were, and they'd die if they weren't. Your mind has remained agile enough. Naturally. I never heard of salatosis inhibiting intelligence. Would you like some coffee? Is that part of the test? Whether more coffee is actually drunk than you drink yourself? No, no. That doesn't help. It would be very easy for me to make half what I thought I made. To fill a non-existent cup with nothing and pass it back to a non-existent girl. <laughs> you look afraid. Why should I be? What am I doing? Am I doing something I don't know I'm doing? No. Would you like me to wash the cups for you when we're done? That won't prove anything. Next time they were used, I could just imagine they were washed, couldn't I? Where are you going? To find out if you're real. My ship? Go ahead. Good luck. said. None of the others were really afraid of me. Ah, I can't tell yet. Nothing's happened. The meters all read 15 pounds to the square inch air pressure, but that's no good. I can't tell if I'm reading them at all. Oh, well, the wall's solid enough. My hand hurts. That doesn't prove anything. Supposing I open my faceplate. If there's no ship and no air... Oh, 
All right. My face plate's open. I'm breathing air. But then again, on the other hand, my face plate may still be closed. Maybe I only think it's open. I can't tell. I can't tell that she isn't real. That means it's finally gotten me. It gets everyone. I don't really know if anything's real. If I'm real. If this space station is real. The planet, the universe, the galaxy. Maybe all life is in my mind. I think, therefore, I am. Yes, I remember that from school. Oh, I'm tired. I've got to get back to the station. Very tired. Close my faceplate. If I ever opened it. Get back to the station. Got a headache. Terrible headache. I'm very right now? Here, drink this. Mm. What happened? You came in the station lock and passed out. How long have I been out? About 24 hours. You're a very sick man, Mr. Ward. <laughs> Reality. Very important thing, isn't it? most important thing there is to learn. Merely to you? Solitosis naturally affects what matters most to the individual. But we needn't talk about that. But I know now. You're not real. You can't be. Even though I feel you are. How did you decide that? I couldn't prove you weren't. Not on your ship. I'm too far gone to figure out any test that'll work. But if you are real, then how did you avoid solitosis? The only way there is. There are 48 men and women in the relief ship that's in orbit around your planet right now. I came down in the pickup rocket. We have well above the critical number of people. I keep rational by knowing they're up there. In the orbit. And as soon as I'm ready, I'll take you back up there. Well, I suppose I can wait. I don't really care if you're real or not anymore. I know. It'll take a long time before you care. You sound sad. What's the matter? It's the way you look at me. What do you mean? What do you see when you look at me? Well, you're strong. Sort of quietly beautiful. About my age. You're wearing a tunic and slacks. And you don't have a wedding ring. <laughs> I noticed that. That's what I thought you saw. I'm real, but not your picture of me. I'm a doctor, Mr. Ord. All first contacts with station officers are made by trained psychiatrists. I'm a doctor. And I was a girl once. But that was 40 years ago. I'm 66. You can't be. Oh yes. It was very nice to be a girl again. I could see myself in your eyes. 
and I almost felt young again. As I grow old in the next few weeks, Mr. Ord, you'll be recovering. That will show you how your case is progressing. When you see me as I really am, you'll be all right. Assuming you're real, Marilyn, it really must take something to come down alone to see one of us. <laughs> I think I see you now, as you really are. Captain? Yes, Mr. Chaka. Pickup rocket all secured from Pluto number three. How is the poor fellow? Good as can be expected. He came on board with Dr. Lin. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, these guys throw me. There he was, holding her hand, looking in her eyes like he was in love with her. Yes, I know. All right, Mr. Chaka. Prepare for blastoff. X. X. Minus one. You have just heard X minus one. Originally presented on May 15th, 1956 by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine. Tonight, by transcription, X minus one has brought you Hallucination Orbit, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by J.T. McIntosh and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in tonight's cast were Mark Kalita as Colin Ord, Lothar Tuppen as the Captain, Jack Ward as Mr. Danbury, Jeff Billard as Mr. Chaka, Angela Young as Una, Jan Deiter as Elsa, and Tanya Milojevich as Marilyn. Sound design, direction, and mastering by Jeffrey Billard. Opening sequence by Lothar Tuppen. Special thanks to Larry Groby and the Generic Radio Workshop for providing the script. This program is dedicated to our dear amigo Bill Holweg, who loved the X-1 series and who opened the way for many of us. This is Lothar Tuppen speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to master dramatist Mr. Jeffrey Billard and the audio collective company Mark Kalita, Lothar Tuppen, Angela Young, Jan Dider, Jeff Billard, of course, and Tanya Malayevich. Thank you for coming to the Playhouse tonight for our inaugural performance. Please join us next week for more recreations of old-time radio plays. Tickets are available as you leave. Until then, thank you again, David, for letting me have tonight's honor. I'll be sitting back in those seats next week. Until then, I'm Jack Ward. Good day from Halifax, Nova Scotia. And that concludes our feature this week for the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, features, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their copyright holders and no infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society and is a proud member of the Mutual Audio Network, where we listen and imagine together. Please join Jack Ward and myself next week at this time for our next grand performance feature.
no one knows where he comes from. Some say he's not a man. Some say he's a force. Not of nature, but of something more primal than that. He's the acid taste of vengeance you can't quite swallow down in a town that's besieged by fear an unbreathed regret. Others say he was a man who wouldn't rest until all the pain in the world was fed back to those who minded out of others. He's only known by one name, from county to county, in the hours past dawn, and in the haze-filled air, you'll see him walking towards you if you keep secrets, if you harm folks. He's the drifter, and he won't stop till sorrow's end. A weird western series from Jeffrey Billard starring The Drifter. From Audio Groovecats and the Amigo Collective. Coming 2023 only on Mutual with Episode 1 before a wind.